これですね、これがあのメインのセッションとしては、あの残りがライトニングトークなので、最後の、このホルテの最後のセッションに、えー、なります。ブラッドリーズ・パトリックさんによるプロファイリングアンドオプティマイズの銀行です。よろしくお願いします。Oh, thank you. <笑>
there's kind of all the code, so you can do this later too, and there's some description of what we'll be doing. So, let's start. So, we're gonna start with this little program called demo.go, and I'll show you the program first before we look at the code. We can say go run demo.go, and it's running on localhost. And basically it just says welcome your visitor number one, I reload, visitor number two. Pretty fancy web app, I know, but we gotta start somewhere. We also support a URL parameter that says color equals red, and we can say, you know, color equals blue, or whatever we want, as long as it looks like a, a word. So this is, this is the web application we're going to be profiling and analyzing. Um, the code is just a single file, the package main. Maybe make it a little bigger. Um, it starts here in func main. We just say that we're starting on port 80. We register the handle high handler at slash high. And then we block forever listening for new connections on port, one, on port 8080 on localhost. And every incoming Every incoming HTTP request gets run in its own separate Go routine, which you can think of as a very lightweight thread or fiber. And this is the code for our HTTP handler. We're gonna see if the color parameter they provided looks like um, either empty string. It, it has to have zero or more word characters, so no spaces. And if we try to do something like, um, like that, we'll say optional color is invalid. And then we're gonna increment a global variable visitors plus plus, set the content type to text HTML, and then this is my modern web design right here, I'm using CSS, I'm saying color equals whatever, and then I say welcome, your visitor number, and I stringify the integer, and put an exclamation mark. So, the first thing, we should run the test. So, we could, we could build it like this, before we said, we said go run, but if we say go build, then we have a demo binary. Starts up quickly. To run the test, we say go test. Except for we have no tests. So at least they all passed, all zero of them. But let's actually write some. So in Go, you write a file called go test.go by convention. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, live demos. Demo test go. Okay, so you can do, we'll just put package main just like the other one was. And the way you write a test in Go is you type test and then whatever. It could be called test blah blah blah, but we'll call it test handler high. Because as you remember, whoops, we'll look at demo over here, we have this handle high, so. And if you make it take a testing.t, then it becomes a test function. So on my editor's save, it automatically added the imports, so I don't have to type the imports. Now, if we run go test, yay, it all passes. Or I can say go test as a v. <laughs> oh, and that one test handler high worked. So that's good. We should actually test something, though. So. Um, I'll take a Kelsey Hightower cheat sheet trip and tip from his cheat sheet and just copy some stuff here. Um, so there's this, the thing that we're actually testing is called handle high, which takes a response writer, which is an interface that something that can respond to HTTP requests and HTTP request. So the HTTP test package has something called new recorder which returns us something that implements the response writer interface, so we can test it. And then we need a, an HTTP request, so we're gonna pass the response writer to, um, I guess, handle high, not handle root, and we're gonna parse this as an HTTP request. So I wrote another little function here that takes the testing.t and v, which is the HTTP request string that we're passing from here, as it would come on the wire, and then we're gonna parse it 
And if there's any error parsing it will just fail the test right away by calling t.fatal. And for now we'll just run the handler and then at the end we'll see if the response recorder, if the res the result of it contained the phrase visitor number. And notice all the imports got automatically added at the top. So now I run it and it still all passes. If you want to see it fail we could say visitor number that and now it fails. Unexpected output. So, so now we have a basic test. Um, there's also another way to write a test. This is just all kind of in memory. It's not using any network or whatever. The other way to write a test, which will be more critical later, is to actually use the whole, use a whole client and server. So what we can do here is say HTTP test make a new server, and this will listen on some port on localhost using the HTTP handler defined in handle high. Defer is uh, built in to go in the language that says run this function when, when my enclosing function returns. So this like does clean up stuff when you're done. Then we're gonna use go's HTTP client to actually do a real fetch over the network to localhost hitting the test server URL. And if there's any error fetching this, we'll just return uh, an error. And we're gonna check that the response, we're gonna add some new tests here. We'll re test that the response headers are text HTML, char set UTF-8. Then we're gonna slurp the whole body using IO util read all to, and then we'll verify, well, well, I guess this just prints out what it got. So now if we run this, handler high and handler test server, so it passes also, and you can see it's log, it slurped and got that, your visitor number two, because visitor number one was this test, I guess. Um, so our tests are still passing. We, we might feel confident at this point that there are no bugs, but there is a bug and there's a data race here. The data race is that we have this global variable called visitors and we're reading it and writing it right here on this line. But Go's race detector, Go has a race detector built in. You just say go test dash, dash race and this link uses uh, ASAN and TSAN, the, the thread the C++ like thread analyzer, the same library, it uses that inside Go and recompiles your program using the race detector. So all memory accesses and are annotated. But it still thinks things are fine. The problem, the reason it thinks everything's fine is it didn't actually see a race. The race detector never has any false positives, but it does have false negatives. So let's do two HTTP requests at once. So back in our demo code, when we're hitting the server, what we can actually do here is do two requests at once. So let's, um, let's just do a simple for loop. We'll do two requests. And for each, each one, we'll start a little uh, go routine here with an anonymous function. And we're just gonna run all this. Oops. And then when I save it, it'll automatically indent. Assuming I can type. So, make that a little bigger. But, so go, when you put go before a function call, it just starts, it's like the start we saw in Perl 6 before, kind of. It basically starts a lightweight thread to do it. But then, it'll keep going, and so this whole thing would end. So we want to wait for those things to finish. So one thing we could do is make a wait group here sync wait group, and before we start the function, we can say there's one more unit of work out, outstanding, and here we can say that it's done. So when this function returns, it'll decrement, but before we start the function, we'll say we'll add one unit of work, and here we can say wait for them all to be done. So now when we run the test, it still all passes, but if we run it with dash, not ray, we run it with dash race, we now get a failure and the command exited with a failure. So if we scroll up here, we can actually see that it says warning, there was a data race. This go routine, go routine 19, on line 17 did a, a read and this go routine down here did a write. So this is undefined behavior. And so whenever there's a data race, 
ru the rule number one, the only rule is you go fix the data race because the Go runtime, unlike like the JVM, basically makes no promises. If there's a data race, the compilers basically are allowed to do crazy optimizations, and so we need to go fix that race. So there's several ways that we could fix it. So back to our demo code. Um, you could use channels and you can like send messages to like kind of like an actor go routine that's keeping track of the count. Or we could just kind of be lazy and make a mutex. So let's be lazy and make a music text for now. Instead of an int, we're just gonna use an anonymous type that embeds a mutex so we get all the, uh, the methods from sync that mutex and then the count. So here we can say, visitors.lock, we can say visitors.n++, we can say our visit num equals visitors.n, then we could unlock the mutex. So this is code, you, you typically don't use locks and like mutexes in Go code, but um, this is lazy and it works, and you can do it if you want. Now if we run the code under the race detector, uh, visit num declared and not used, Oh yeah, so Go also makes it a, a fatal error if you ever make a variable and you never actually read from it because that generally indicates an error like it is right now. So now I actually change this to be visit num. Oh, it's visitor num. And now all my tests pass. Okay, so now that we have a working program that doesn't actually have bugs in it, we can try to actually make it fast. So this is the race detector section. We fix the race. Okay, so we already wrote, we already wrote these test functions that start with capital test and take a testing.t. The other thing we can do is make a benchmark function. So if we call that benchmark handler high, and it takes a testing.b for benchmark. Then we could just, you count from b to n when the testing framework tells you how many iterations to do. And then we're just gonna basically do the same thing. We're going to, we'll assume it's correct at this point. And we'll just say for n number of iterations that the testing framework tells, make a new recorder and run the thing. We could even, um, we could even pull out the, uh, the request up here because it's gonna be the same for every, because it's read only. So now, when we say go test, we can say, it takes a regular expression of which, uh, of which test to run. So we're gonna say run dot, so run all the benchmarks. Oh, undefined t. So, this is this rec function, took a t, but of course that won't compile because testing.b is not compatible with testing.t. But in our func rec here, there's an interface called testing.tb, which is the, uh, the common methods between a testing.t and a testing.b. So now you see it's running our benchmarks for us. And you can see that first it ran all the tests. And if you don't want to run all the tests, you can say run equals an irregular expression that will match nothing. And I guess it still ran them all, but there were none to run. And it told you how fast it was. So we don't actually know if that's fast or not. Um, I mean, it's only 10,000 nanoseconds per operation, and it ran, it ran that handler 200,000 times. But it probably can be faster. So what we can say now is we can say CPU profile equals prof.cpu. Same thing, except for now, it wrote out this file called prof.cpu, which is only about 5K. And we can use Go's profiler, we can say go tool pprof. Oh, and the other thing that it did when you ran that is it, it left the compiled binary here, this demo.test. So we have that, and we have the CPU profile that we asked for. So now we can say go tool pprof, and the binary name, and then the profile. And now we're in the, the profiler, and we can say things like show me all the top uh, places where this is a sampling profiler, so there's a thread that's going kind of in the background and just sending a, uh, a signal to your program in and looking at stack trace and seeing where you were. So we can do that. I'll put this at the top of the screen. Or you can say uh, sort by cumulative time. 
And you can start to see like, cumulatively, we were in benchmark handler high. You can ignore the first couple frames, that's just the test system. You can see we're in benchmark handler high, which called handler high. But then you can see we spent 95% of our time in regex match string, which is a little weird. It shouldn't be that slow. The other way you can look at it is that you can type web and it fires up an SVG graph in your browser and you can actually see where it's all going. So sometimes it's easier to understand it looking at this. So you see there's the uh, the benchmark runner system calling benchmark handler high and it's calling handle high. That's calling match string. And then you see it's calling regex compile and it's doing that, it's spending 93% of its time in regex compilation. So we look back at our code back in demo.go. So there's this function regex match string, but that compiles this string every time. And this is the other return value that I'm ignoring with underscore. This is the error if the regex compilation fails. The problem is that's really inefficient. We really should just build that regular expression once. So we can say like color regex goes regex must compile. And then the same thing. And now we can get rid of all that and say if not color regex dot match string and get rid of all that. So actually let's save this for the old results. So here are our old results. I'm gonna put that in prop, call that CPU.0 just so we have it. And now we're gonna run the benchmarks again. We'll say uh, and I'll put that in CPU.1. Now, instead of taking 10,000 nanoseconds per op, it only took 1,000 nanoseconds per op. And we could run things like bench comp to compare CPU zero to CPU one. And we can see a nice little pretty way to show you all your benchmarks and how they were adjusted. So we can see we got 89% faster. Or we could look at a, a profile again. And if we look at the top, we can see now we no longer see regex in there or we never see regex match string or regex compile. And now things look different. Um, now we see handle high and regex match string doesn't really show up or if it's here, I'm not really seeing it. Oh yeah, there's regex put and regex beget. That's getting execution uh, context for the regular expression. But it's actually very quick to uh, evaluate those regular expressions. Now we see other stuff in the top of the list. Um, looking back at this list, you can say, you can say top 40 cumulative and see a little bit more. You can see here, you see the runtime scheduler, there's a lot in there and a lot in malloc GC. Malloc GC is the function that allocates any memory in Go. And when you allocate memory, whenever you allocate memory, it looks to see have, is my heap getting too big? Is it time for me to do a garbage collection? And if so, which isn't strictly true now with the concurrent GC, now the GC is kind of always running, but malloking causes the GC, it adds pressure to it to run more often. So in general, when you see the GC showing up too much in your CPU profile, it's time to go look at why you're allocating in the first place. So now we're gonna switch and look to see why are we allocating. So one thing we could do here in our benchmark we have our benchmark. There's a little convenience thing where you can say b.reportalex. So we're gonna run the same benchmark. And you can see that it's allocating 720 bytes per operation in not, and it is doing nine allocations. So let's uh, save that off as kind of our baseline. And let's see why. So. Before we did CPU profile, the other thing we can do is we can say mem profile. So we can say and save that to a file called prof.mem. 
And just like we did go tool pprof demo.tusk.cpu, now we can say prof.mem. And there's various flags. By default, it shows you why you're retaining memory now. Like, if you have a program that the heap is too big, you can say, why is my program sitting at one gig when it should be like a couple K? The other thing you can ask is, why is it generating so much garbage that then it And we can see that cumulative from ben benchmark handler high, we allocated, you know, 698 meg. And likewise, we can bring it up in web and see that uh, the benchmark handler high itself is allocating 151 meg of memory. But if you include its callers or its callees, um, you see that there's another 698 meg. So the handle high function, the thing we're trying to optimize, is allocating all that. So we can list handle high, and we can see a code dump, and we can see, well, 372 meg is coming from there, and 172 meg is coming from this line, which is this whole write. So one quick trick is this content type line, it turns out it's not even necessary, because Go does the same HTML5 content sniffing that everything else does. So as long as you're writing out HTML, so what this is actually doing is it's getting your, setting your response headers, but once this happens lazily, the first time you change the response headers, it has to allocate a map for it and put these things in the map. But the Go HTTP server has an optimization for that, so we can just comment this out. It's not even important. Um, so if we run this again with that commented out, let's first make sure all, all our tests still pass. All the tests still pass, so now we could, uh, Let's run the uh, memory tests again. Now you see we could um, run bench comp mem.0 versus mem.1. You see before we were doing 720 bytes per op, now we're doing 352, so that's down. So if we go back into the uh, memory profiler and do top 30 cumulative, you see Okay, it's still handle high, and we could list handle high, and see, wait, that's the, oh, we didn't run them. That's an old binary. Run the profiler again to record a new prof.mem. Oh, you can see, so that line is now gone. It's still just a comment. Now all of our memory allocation is coming from this line here. So the problem is what we're doing here is we're concatenating strings together just to convert it back to a byte slice because the signature of w.write takes a slice of bytes, which is um, basically an array of mutable bytes. So we probably can avoid all the string concatenation just to do another copy back. This is doing many copies. So there's this HTTP response writer implements the IO writer interface. So in Go, there's this interface called IO writer, which is something that can write, and the HTTP response writer is a superset of that, and it also has a write method. So, and there's something called fump.fprintf, which looks like fprintf in C, that takes any writer, so instead of just taking a file descriptor number like C, anything that can write, we can call fprintf to that. So here, we can change this to fump.fprintf. We're gonna write to that, and we're gonna basically take this pattern, but instead of that, we'll put, and then we'll say welcome, your visitor number, percent D, or we can just say percent D, goes uh, format package is much more powerful than C's. And we could say uh, r.form value of color. And we don't have to do that sprintf. That was actually allocating memory as well before converting from integer to a string. Now we're just going to let the fumped package deal with it for us. And then get rid of that. Okay, so first, this should be, this should be equivalent. But let's run the test to make sure. Test still pass. So now we can run the benchmarks. Now we're down to 224 bytes per op. Let's uh, put that in mem dot, I don't know, two. 
And if we run our comparison, now we're 68% less bytes allocated. Um, we should probably actually go back and see if we're actually saving CPU time too. So we could say, uh, Oh, we are saving, see, this is this one up here, the number of nanoseconds per op. So now we're 26% faster because we're putting less pressure on the garbage collection to run. So we can look at it, we can say, let's write out a new uh, memory profile. And I have this little alias called profmem, which just runs go to OP prof with Alex Base. So profmem. Top, cumulative, and we can list again, handle high. And you can see this is now a lot less. Now it's down to 87 meg. The question is, why is it even doing that? You can even, in addition to list, you can say dis disassemble handle high. And you can actually see the x86 that's generated. And you can see, there's this call to runtime convert T to E, which is type to empty interface. And so a quick diversion into uh, Go data structures. So just like in Perl, how Perl has like AVs and CVs and HVs, um, Perl has a, or Go has a couple of core data structures that you should know. Um, in Go, you can have a string, which is just a mutable set of bytes. You have a slice, which is a mutable set of items, which could be anything. Um, an interface, which is something that can do something, uh, including the empty interface, which is something that can do nothing, which is everything, because everything can do nothing, at least nothing. Uh, and then you have a map, uh, a channel, which is something you could communicate between Go routines on, and func. So in memory, a string is just two words. So on 64-bit, the two words are eight bytes each. So a string, the string header that gets passed around by value is a pointer to some bytes and a length. So in this case, it's just uh, some pointer to the H and a five to mean hello. If we do some operation like truncated at four bytes, say we do a slice operation and we slice off to the four, now the memory is still there that says hello, but our string only represents the first four bytes, uh, hell. Likewise, we can take off one byte and we can slice from one on, and now we just advanced our pointer um, and we decremented our length. So now it's just length, uh, length four. And we can never get back to that H, you can't reverse. Unless there could be another string elsewhere in memory that is still pointing to that, but this handle to that string is now always LO or shorter. Likewise, there's a slice. This is a mutable, a mutable array, basically. It's a handle onto an underlying array. And this is three words of memory. There's a pointer to whatever. If you have T, it could be any arbitrary type. And so a slice of T has a pointer to a T array. Let's say in this case it's bytes. And it has a length and has a capacity for future growth. So in this case we have hello world. And let's imagine that we just have hello, but the rest of the buffer has something else in it, it could be junk, uh, it could be something from somebody else's previous operation, but you're saying that only five bytes of this are, va are valid, but there's 15 bytes total for this growing room. So if I do a slice of 13, now my slice represents hello world, and I still have some gibberish at the end, and I could, uh, I could say s equals append of s, and then add another one. So append takes a slice and adds other elements to the slice, and it uses the underlying array it uses the existing memory if there's space for it. Otherwise, so it can do one more append, and now the length and the capacity are the same, and now if we try to append something else to it, uh, oh, so here I'm slicing back further, I'm taking a byte off, so now that H is no longer reachable. And now if I try to add one more byte to it, notice the length and the capacity are still the same at 14. Now it ends up allocating double the length of the original one, so now we have 28 bytes, and it copies everything over before appending, and now these are all zero memory. So that's a slice. The, the main point of it is it's three words of memory. An interface value is basically anything that can do uh, dynamic dispatch, and an interface, an empty interface can hold anything. Uh, otherwise, you can make restrictions on it must at least implement a certain interface. 
But an interface is always two words of memory. The first one is a pointer to its runtime type. This could be its like, its uh, method tables and various algorithms for supporting equality and stuff like that. And then the second word is always a pointer, and it could be the pointer of the original data. For instance, if you s if you had a type T, and your type T was like a struct with two fields, let's call them X and Y, and you said var E of type empty interface equals that, what it would be, what this variable E would be at runtime is actually one word that was a pointer to the T type, which is like a runtime internal type, and then it would be a pointer to y your two bytes of memory that had 42 and 100. So that's one way that you can put something in interface. This is the most compact way because the pointer goes directly there. If you try to put something that's bigger than a pointer in there, for instance, remember a string is two words of memory. A string is a byte pointer and a length. You can't put, you can't put 16 bytes in eight bytes here. So instead there's a level of indirection and this is a pointer to a string this is transparent, you can't see this at the language level, but this is happening behind the scenes, it's doing this allocation. And then that is the string. Or you can make your own type that has a zero length memory representation. So you can make this type called foo that has no fields, so it takes up no memory. And if you put one of those inside an empty interface, the interface value contains a pointer to your foo type, so you can still have methods on this even though it does nothing or it, it can't store anything itself. And the second field is just unused at zero. That's the interface. As far as a, a code pointer, uh, a func pointer in Go, whether it's a normal func pointer or a closure, it's always eight bytes and it's a pointer to a two word structure where the first structure is the code pointer. So this is the actual exe uh, executable code, wh whatever processor architecture that is and any closure data, any lexical data that it closes over. So in this case, uh, the code pointer points to wherever, you know, the code actually begins or wherever it is in the object file and there's no data because it's just a static thing. So every function in your program actually has this symbol called whatever.fm or that's an implementation detail. But it's all, this doesn't actually cause any allocation to assign a function to a, a func typed variable. Um, but if you have a little closure, in this case, this function is incrementing something that's outside of it and you were closing over this X variable. In that case, this allocates a little 16 byte uh, piece of memory where the code points to the actual code, but then the closed over variables are there. Anyway, again, the point is a func is eight bytes. Likewise, maps and channels are just eight byte little transparent wrappers around some internal type that you can't see. But they f the point is they fit inside an empty interface because they're only eight bytes. So conclusion, those are, those are the, uh, the Go data types. Um, maps, chans, and funks, you can put an empty interface without allocation, but a string and a slice cannot go inside of an interface. So now we're back looking at this and we see we're doing these conv TTEs. And the reason we're doing that is we're using fumpt fprintf. And notice the first one is the, the destination, and then we have the format, and we have two arguments. The actual signature of that, of go doc fprintf, it takes an IO writer, it takes a format string, and then takes any number of empty interface. The problem though, like we showed before, if you said something like var, empty interface equals foo, this line by itself ends up doing an allocation because it has to make a 16 byte string header and fit it into, and fit it into that eight byte data variable. So now we're gonna get really disgusting. You shouldn't write code like this, but we're gonna try to just remove all the allocations just for fun. Um, and in the interest of time, we'll cheat a little bit. We have 10 minutes. Um, not there. Moving all the allocations. Okay. So this is gross, and please don't ever write code like this unless it's really important. Sync.pool is a processor local 
allocation pool and you can decide when it's empty what it returns and this is optional. By default it will return nothing. But we're going to say if our per processor pool is empty we're going to return a new bytes buffer and bytes dot buffer is just a small little utility wrapper around a slice of bytes with some handy methods on it. And here instead of saying f print f what we're going to do is this. We're going to get something out of the processor local pool, the buffer that we're going to write into it, and we're going to assume that it's a byte stop buffer. And we're going to use defer to put it back into the processor local pool when we're done. We're going to reset it because it might have been written to by the person before us on this processor. And we can write the h1, the form value, color, the welcome, your visitor number. At this point there's no convenience method on this byte stop buffer to append an integer. But we can call buff.bytes to get the raw underlining thing and then use the stir conf package to append onto a byte slice. So we append the visitor number onto it and then we append our final exclamation mark and we print. And this is disgusting and you shouldn't do this but just for fun. This is visit none. We still have 192 bytes per op. What did we forget? We could say, uh, not mem profile. Oh, so that actually, so now handle or high has no allocations, but if we look in benchmark handle or high, our caller one, every time we call new response recorder, this is creating a new, new garbage. So we can go, I mean, this isn't even important, but we could put this up here, and then every time we're done with that response recorder, we can like reset it. And we can make a little function, um, I think I have one here. Um, we can, Iterate through the map of headers from the previous response and delete all of them. So we keep that header map, delete it all. We could reset the response body from the previous one and then basically set the zero value except for the response buffer and the headers. So now if we run it, we're down to zero bytes of allocation and zero allocation per op. So, um, bench com from what have we started at before mem.0. So, you know, we made it 64% faster and no more allocations. But it's, uh, this is using all the tools. Um, the, other, the other one I didn't cover but could show briefly is the contention profiling. So now we have, let me show contention. So in Go by default it uses all the CPUs you have available, but we were only testing really on a single CPU. We were doing a straight line benchmark. So back in our benchmark there's a convenience thing where we can say b.run parallel and it takes, it gives you a little pb testing.pb parallel benchmark object and then we could just run this and it will use all the CPUs you have available on your machine. And now if we say, let's only run the parallel one, it's now taking 320 nanoseconds per op compared to, what was it before, 427. So it did better, it was able to use more CPUs. But what we can say here is a block profile, prof.block, and we can figure out why we're not getting like a 4x speed up. So you could say go tool pprof prof.block and you can see, well, yeah, I had the wrong binary and I'm out of question. I'm out of time I think. Oh. Demo.test and you can see that it's actually contention inside the regex package because the regex package has a uh, 
uh, execution context and it has a, a free list of those. And so inside of regex do execute, um, it's actually trying to get, saying get and put, these are private methods. And the mute checks inside of get and put has problems over multiple CPUs. And so we have discussions going on to fix this, but for now you can have a, a regular expression per CPU if, or you could just not use regular expressions, but this is Perl conference, you have to use regular expressions for everything. So anyway, I think we'll have to go into questions. There's a lot more fun go tooling. There's some um, coverage stuff you can do. You can say, uh, Go tool test cover and get a cover profile, and then you could get coverage reports about what code was executed and what code wasn't executed, and that's kind of built in. But um, yeah, Go has fun tools, and I think that uh, I should wrap it up. Thank you. When I, when I want to create work my ordinal to to have some benchmarking and profiling task. Is there any way to, is there an easy way to do that? Like uh, some library or so, like that? Is there an, is the, is the question, is there an easier way to write it than this? Why like to pass profiles and like um, um, right, visualize or comparing and, and Oh, the question is, is there an easier way to compare the differences between profiles over time when you make it faster? And I th is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I showed, for instance, that uh, bench comp tool. And this was like the first version someone wrote. Now people are writing other ones like bench stat, which do more like statistics and is actually math people like more. And so there's actually a lot of work on this space now to keep logs and to to make the benchmarking framework adjust the number of work to uh, make sure that it's fair and is like statistically valid. But yeah, this is something that people are working on still right now. Yep. Yeah, so um, the question is about how do you detect uh, memory leaks in Go programs? And you can, so what I was showing where you write a benchmark function is one thing you can do if, if, it's, uh, if you can isolate your code. But if you see a production server that's leaking, what you can do is you can just implement or you can import the, um, the net HTTP pprof package. You do the empty import like that, which means you want to import it for its side effects, but you're not going to use any symbol from inside of it. And that will register um, an HTTP handler for you that you can hit with pprof. And then you can actually hit a live production server that's running. And you could then say go tool pprof um, blah, 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 debug pprof. You know, and assuming that was up, it would c connect to it, it would collect samples, and you could look at CPU of a, a live running server, contention, memory profiling. So this is how we do all of our um, kind of production debugging, uh, even inside Google. And so the same thing is available in the uh, in open source. Um, did that answer it? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, I'm personally okay to use uh, CUI tools to debug programs, but my colleagues may complain or 
is it there any uh, GUI support for put back in this code? Uh, the uh, some of some of your team uh, plan to use, uh, put this feature to to be available in GUI ID support. Uh, yeah, so the question is basically, these are command line tools and where are the sexy GUI tools around all this? Um, so the big ones, are like the IntelliJ people are, have really good Go plugin lately. So I think Sublime and IntelliJ are the good ones and I think they have front end wrappers around all this stuff. Um, I just, I learned it all when it was new before we had a GUI. So I was, I'm presenting the tools I know, but I think there is a way to do it with a GUI too. Um, so the question is, you can disassemble inside, you know, and like look at the line counts, but you want to use a tool after you disassemble? What, what sort of tool do you want to use after the disassembly? Uh, the question is, does that just show the result of the disassemble? Uh, yeah, so if you want the disassemble without any profiling, you can also just, um, you can also just say like go tool compile dash s and then like, you know, demo dot go and you can see um, what the Go compiler would have written out assembly-wise. Um, so we have we have uh, disassemblers for like five or six architectures built into Go, but um, so we just use the same disassemblers in the profiler, and it just counts where the uh, the PC is, uh, the program counter is, whenever it gets a signal, and then looks up the stack and records an array of program counters, and then later we use the same disassembler from from here to just show it prettily um, inside of uh, the pprof tool. I don't know if that actually answers the question, but um, <laughs> but you, I mean, you can use all the normal Linux obj dump, or you can use um, the Go native disassembler. Uh, uh, the question is like what of all these like tools, what is my favorite go tool? Um, I, I've always been pretty addicted to the uh, the CPU and memory profiling. Uh, especially before Go's garbage collector got as good as it is today, it used to be really important to not allocate memory if you wanted to make something fast. Nowadays with Go 1.5's new concurrent garbage collector, it's a, it's a lot easier to be wasteful with memory allocation and just pay for it with one of your un unused CPUs because um, a lot of people have more CPU than they need or they're using nowadays. But if you want to write really fast code, it's important to kind of not allocate, not, not waste. So the, the CPU and memory profilers are really fun, but there's also other fun tools inside Go, like um, uh, you can say like Go list, and you can say Go list standard library to get like the list of all the packages in the standard library, or you can say Go list dash JSON, and you can like, you know, the XML package, and you can see like a dump of stuff that's uh, metadata about a package. And you can actually pass custom formats to that instead of JSON. And so you can kind of write programs to introspect metadata about, Go has a lot of introspection tools to, um, to make things prettier. And like GoFont, like if I write code all ugly like this, 
and I put this up there, and I put lots of spaces there, and lots of spaces here. When I save it in my editor, it all just adjusts. So this, this is the go form, go font or go format tool. So I think that one is probably my favorite, making everything look pretty all the time. Go. Thank you. Um, so the, the question is about um, support for native daemons in Go. Um, I think that's about programs daemonizing themselves on startup. Is that correct? Um, in any case. Um, yeah, the, there's, so the Go runtime is multi-threaded, which means you can't do a lot of, you can't do, play games with fork and doing work between fork and exec. So there's, we have sub-process support that is, um, that is built in and that's very careful about doing fork and exec safely in a multi-threaded program, which is one of the most impossible things to do in Unix. And uh, so as a result of that, a lot of people like to fork, do some stuff, and drop root. And our answer is kind of like, just don't do that. Programs shouldn't daemonize themselves. You should use another tool to daemonize your program. So whether that's you know, system D or some other program, um, I know people are, have different feelings about system D, but inside Google, you know, we use something like we call Borg. Now the open source version is Kubernetes that uh, Kelsey Hightower was showing. So whether you're using cube control or Docker or system D, you should use some higher level um, machine supervision, orchestration sort of thing to run your binaries. Binaries shouldn't be responsible for like being their own sysadmins. A binary should just write to standard out or standard error, and it should receive its input from the network or standard in. Um, but yeah, the basic answer is don't do that. I don't know. So the question is about, um, you know, we have, this is, we've done the six releases of Go now from Go 1.0 to 1.5, which came out yesterday. The question is what is coming in Go 1.6 or 1.7? Uh, the main thing that's happening in 1.6 is there's a new compiler backend, at least for 64-bit uh, x86, where we have a new SSA intermediate form, and we do S optimizations, all the classic SSA optimizations. So we should have a lot better code gen. And then Go 1.7 will do that for the other six or seven architectures. And Go 1.6 will also have uh, HTTP2 support, so uh, both for a client and server, assuming I finish it. But uh, the server is basically done. The HTTP2 client still needs to be worked on. But yeah, we do a release every six months. So uh, February 1st or so should be Go 1.6. Yep. Cool, thank you. That's it. Okay. では、時間ですので、ブラックビーズのトークさんの発表を終了いたします。ありがとうございました。